Uh, welcome to the short lecture series on this Thursday, the 24th of September 2020. It's 1 p.m. in Britain, but early morning in the US and the evening in Australia. I've had apologies today from Hugh Owen and Verdat Shiyu, who will not be able to attend. Uh, this series of lectures is by guest presenters concentrating on Earth expansion, paleogravity or related subjects. If anyone has any suggestions for specific lectures or speakers, please let me know. The programme of planned lectures can be viewed at the web page dinox.org slash lectures. Our lecture today is by James Mexlow, uh, Modelling Seafloor Cross. The lecture will focus on modelling seafloor from the present to the Triassic. James did his PhD based on his models of the seafloor. Since then, he has written many articles and three books about those models. Uh, here, here's the latest, uh, published in 2018 beyond plate tectonics on settling settled science. Uh, this lecture today is the first of a two part lectures and the second will be in a fortnight's time. So I'll pass you over to James now. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to my podcast. My talk today is based on 25 years of PhD and post-PhD research. As Stephen mentioned, this research has culminated in publication of a number of books, the latest of which is called Beyond Plate Tectonics, Unsettling Settled Science. In my latest book, I look beyond the achievements of conventional plate tectonics in order to show you a uniquely different way of physically modeling the Earth's ancient crustal plates back in time. This modelling uses modern global geological mapping of the oceans and continents in order to constrain plate assemblage and Earth's ancient radius back in time. From this modelling, an extensive range of modern global observational data was then used to quantify the outcomes of this study. In this presentation, it is important to appreciate that what I will be presenting is a data modelling exercise not a theory modelling exercise. In other words, I make no assumptions and I do not apply any premises. All I have done is model the modern global mapping and observational data without constraining the data to any preconceived theory. It is also important to appreciate that I am not modelling plate tectonics, so therefore I do not need to constrain the mapping or data to a constant radius Earth premise nor do I need to consider ad hoc constraints in order to make the data fit. All I have done is make models of the Earth to test the concept and to allow the, the Earth to tell its own story. In this podcast, I will be focusing specifically on modelling the seafloor crusts in order to create scale models of the Earth extending from the present day back to the Permian. This study is summarised in the first three models from the right down on screen. Modelling beyond the Permian back to the early Archean, that far left will be presented in a separate podcast. The geological modelling study presented here is based on the geological map of the world as first published by the Commission for the Geological Map of the World and UNESCO in 1990 shown here in model weed projection. This map is based on an extensive program of seafloor magnetic and bathymetric mapping, accompanied by age dating carried out throughout all of the oceans during the 1950s to late 1980s. The colours shown on this map represent what I call time-dependent geology, where the coloured seafloor stripes, for example, represent the preserved growth history of each of the modern plates as basaltic lava is intruded along each of the mid-ocean ridges. 
the ages of each coloured seafloor stripe coincide with the major geological epoch, extending from the pink Pleistocene stripe located along the mid-ocean ridges, for example, through to the blue Jurassic stripes shown are generally located adjacent to the continent, shown here, for example. Similarly, the colours with each of the continents represent rocks that were formed during the major geological periods and eras and coincide with the distribution of the ancient cratons, origins and basins. What this modern geological mapping shows is that all oceans contain a mid-ocean ridge, shown here as the centrally located pink stripes in each ocean. The youngest seafloor crust coincides with new mantle-derived basaltic lava <coughs> currently extend, being extruded along the mid-ocean ridges. In all cases, seafloor crusts increase in age away from the mid-ocean ridges, as shown by the symmetric growth histories and red arrows for each ocean. The oldest exposed seafloor crust for all oceans is early Jurassic, around 170 million years old shown again as pale blue crust located adjacent to the continent. Of particular importance is that all oceans are increasing the surface areas away from their mid-ocean ridges, as again shown by the symmetric growth histories and red directional arrows for each ocean. Putting aside any preconceived constraints or assumptions, from this mapping data, it is logical to conclude that when moving back in time, all plate reconstruction and ore assemblages must be reversed and strictly adhere to the geology preserved in this map. That is, the geology must be reverse engineered back in time. In other words, all mid-ocean ridge basaltic lava must be progressively returned back to the mantle from where it came from. Similarly, all continents must move closer together and in doing so, close off each of, the, each of the oceans in the directions shown by the magenta arrow. So what does this all mean? So what does this all mean? As we all know, conventional plate tectonic studies insist that in order to assemble the various crustal plates back in time, we must progressively close up the Atlantic Ocean and move the adjoining continents together at the expense of the remaining oceans. That is, that is all very well, but the modern geological mapping, which, is, which was completed after plate tectonics was instigated, now shows that in addition to the Atlantic Ocean, each of the other oceans can potentially just as easily be closed off along their respective mid-ocean ridge spreading zones, and each adjoining continent can also just as easily be moved closer together. In the rest of this presentation, this conventional insistence is simply ignored, and the modern geological mapping data will be used to reassemble the plates on a series of spherical models in order to investigate what happens when we successively close off all the oceans along each of their mid-ocean ridge spreading zones. In contrast to constraining plate assemblages to the Atlantic Ocean only, the small Earth models in this next animation will rotate once before removing each coloured seafloor stripe in turn and reassembling the remaining plates together on smaller radius Earth models. As can be appreciated, this represents a unique method of modelling and constraining this readily available geological mapping data. This animation simulates returning the intruded seafloor lava, as well as a proportion of the atmospheric gases and seawater from each of the oceans, back to the mantle, where they originally came from. By doing this, each of the continents are then moved closer together, in effect, reverse engineering the preserved plate growth history back in time. As can be readily seen, in this animation, the remaining crustal plates assembled together on each successive model with a single unique estimated to be better than 99% thick.
You will also note that each model has a north and south pole, along with an equator scaled from these pole locations. These poles were plotted directly from the International Paleopole database of Magalini and Locke, 1996, where each of the published poles plot a diametrically opposed north and south magnetic pole for each model, as they should do. On these models, by the Triassic period, continental and marine sedimentary basins begin to move, form a global network coinciding with relatively shallow continental seas. These sedimentary basins, shown as white on each model, represent a network of low-lying regions where the sediment eroded from the exposed land surfaces accumulates. Logic dictates that by moving further back in time, this erosion process must then be reversed and all young eroded sediments must be progressively returned to the former land surfaces. By returning these sediments to their former land surfaces, it is then feasible for the ancient Earth radius to be further reduced back in time and older continental crust more tightly assembled on pre-Triassic models. By continuing to model back in time to the late Permian period, about 250 million years ago, on this model, all young seafloor volcanic crust, plus most of the marine sediments deposited along the continental shelf, have been removed. And the distribution of published ancient continental seas are also shown in blue. As distinct from conventional practice, what is shown on this model is that all unite precisely with a single unique plate fit to form a global Pangean supercontinent during the late Permian period at around 50% of the present Earth radius. Each of the previous small Earth models also show that large Panthalassa, Iapetus and Tethys oceans are not required during this model reconstruction. These oceans were instead replaced by lesser continental Panthalassa Iapetus and Tethys Sea, which represent precursors to the modern Pacific and Atlantic oceans, as well as ancient sedimentary basins located on many, many of the present day continents. On these post Permian models, the transition from ancient seas to modern oceans only came about when the Pangean supercontinent, shown here, first started to rupture and break up to form the modern continents in the intervening modern ocean. It is envisaged that breakup then initiated draining of the waters from the ancient continental sea into the newly opening modern oceans plus expulsion of new waters from along the newly formed mid-ocean ridge spreading zone. The preliminary conclusions drawn from these increasing radius for those models is that there is no requirement for random, non-predictable, multiple plate fit assemblage options for ill-defined plate history. Nor is there a requirement for extensive, largely hypothetical ancient oceans to comply with a constant surface area premise, or for the fragmentation of any of the modern continents to comply with paleomagnetic parent polar water state. Instead, it is shown that the ancient continental crusts tightly wrap around and fully enclose an ancient smaller Earth. These continental crusts then assemble against continents that were otherwise not previously considered to be related on conventional assemblies, which in turn presents a multitude of new opportunities to study global data distribution. In addition to being able to assemble the mapping data on small Earth models, the information contained on the geological map of the world provides a means to uniquely measure ancient Earth surface areas, and from this to derive ancient Earth radii back in time to at least the Triassic period, some 170 million years ago. The results of this exercise are shown here in the form of a graph of ancient Earth radius relative to geological time. And similarly, a derived formula or calculated Earth radius at any moment in time. 
The red dot shown on this graph represents the locations of each, each um, spherical small earth model constructed during this research. However, in this presentation, I have only highlighted the past 200 million years of history as defined by opening of the seafloor crust. The remaining models will be introduced in a separate podcast. The locations of each model constructed are dictated by the time scales represented by the colours shown on the published geological map. This, this graph shows that the rate of change in Earth radius over time is exponential, with rates of change varying from microns per year during the first 70% of geological history increasing steadily throughout the remaining time to a rate of 22 millimetres per year for the present day. By extrapolating forward in time, it is calculated that the Earth will be of a similar size as the giant planets by around 500 million years into the future. From this graph, it is envisaged that crustal development is an evolving process, intimately related to change in Earth radius surface area and surface curvature over time. This process commenced during the early Archean, some 4,000 million years ago, with an, an extremely long period of slow to steadily, steady continental crustal stretching. This stretching was then followed by a period of steady to rapidly increasing crustal stretching leading to crustal rupture and finally to the breakup of the ancient Pangean supercontinental crust around 250 million years ago to form the modern continents and oceans shown by the vertical dashed line. This entire process was unimaginably slow and protracted, matched only by the unimaginably long span geological time available since original formation and stabilisation of the Earth. To preempt your query as to where all the extra mass comes from, of significance to this research that in year 2000, four identical cluster two satellites were launched by the European Space Agency to study the impact of the sun's activity on the near Earth space environment by flying in formation to gather data around the Earth. For the first time in space history, this mission was able to collect three dimensional information about how the solar wind interacts with the magnetosphere, how it affects near Earth's surface, near Earth's space, and how the giant spherical magnet called Earth reacts with particles within the solar wind. This new information and related discoveries were considered by the European Space Agency's project scientists to be of great importance because they showed how the Earth's magnetosphere can be penetrated by solar particles. The Earth's magnetosphere is now shown to be full of trapped plasma, comprising charged electron and proton particles emanating from the solar wind as it passes the Earth. This flow of plasma into the magnetosphere increases with increase in solar wind density and speed, as well as increase in turbulence in the solar wind. In addition to penetrating the magnetosphere, it has also been shown that plasma travels down along the Earth's magnetic, magnetic field line, lines within the auroral zone, shown as shown entering the Earth at each of the poles. This European study suggested to the scientists that penetration of plasma may be a lot more common than was previously known, and possibly represents a means for the constant flow of charged electrons and protons into the Earth. The most important question that should then come to mind is what happens to these electrons and protons, the very building blocks of all matter in the universe, when they enter the Earth? And the answer to this question is, of course, that they must increase the mass and radius of the Earth over time. In summary, it is concluded that the global tectonic evidence and empirical modelling studies presented in this research more than adequately demonstrate that an increasing radius of Earth is indeed a viable and demonstrable tectonic process. From a geological perspective, 
at no point has any fundamental physical law been violated. The commonly held presumption that Earth radius has remained constant throughout time is simply removed and instead the Earth is allowed to tell its own story. In order to create small Earth models, I simply removed from the Earth what was not previously there. Intruded seafloor volcanic lava, intruded magma and eroded sediment to end up with a Pangean Earth comprising an assemblage of continental crustal components. The empirical evidence presented in this research suggests that plausible alternative models and mechanisms based on the extensive modern global tectonic data and available evidence must then be actively encouraged, not discouraged. This encouragement is desperately needed in order to fuel the traditional scientific method of multiple working hypotheses, so as to promote increased objectivity in the interpretation of all physical observation. In this context, we should then at least consider that modern global plate tectonic observational data may well be better suited to an increasing radius Earth scenario before continuing to unscientifically reject this proposal out of hand. Thank you for your interest, and for those seeking more information, please contact me at the email address shown on screen. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's it. That's it. I think um, we've come back again. Um, so uh, I know we all, we've all got questions. Unfortunately, uh, we're only on the free Zoom meeting time, so so we have less than ten minutes to ask some questions. So I, I know Bill has a question that he wants to ask. So perhaps I'll pass it pass it over direct to Bill. Uh, if anyone else wants to ask a question, uh, perhaps you could type it in. There's a there's a there's a, a chat box down below, so perhaps you could type it in down below. Uh, uh, I want to ask a question, or if um, if you want me to read out your question for you, I c I can read it out. But uh, but uh, as I say, anyway, I'll pass it over to you, Bill. You've got a question, haven't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in reconciling James's small earth modeling with uh, Hugh Owen's cartography. And we, we've discussed this by email. Uh, Owen says that you can't uh, enclose the entire earth before about 700 million years. You have to go back much further to, to get the entire earth covered. And that accordingly, there's an EO Pacific or a Paleo Pacific that existed uh, between the Neoproterozoic and, say, the Permian, that has been subducted, and and but on his model or on his mapping, he shows a nice curve that goes back and, and uh, reaches that singularity around 700 million years. I was wondering, James, if you could address that and how we can reconcile these two different uh, views of the Earth. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, as I mentioned in my uh, return email today, um, you was not privileged privil to this geological mapping when he did his, uh, his, his models and, and Atlas, put together his map of Atlas. He had to rely on uh, manual fitting of the, the continents as best he could. Uh, he adopted, uh, I'm not too sure what metric depth, I think it was 200 metres or something like that for memory, uh, very similar to what um, uh, Dan Carey did in adopting a, a, a specific metric depth as the outer margin of continental shelves. He assumed that the, outer, the continental shelves were actually part of continental crust. What the, the uh, geological mapping uh, the published geological mapping that uh, Klaus Vogel and myself used showed was that um, uh, once you move back in time, you're removing each of those um, seafloor stripes in turn. They all come back together uh, as unique globes, and you're left with a network by the Triassic. You're left with a network of um, white uh, spaces which uh, which are uh, 
marine plateaus and continental shelf uh, sediments, as I mentioned in my email. Uh, these neatly uh, lock together as a network of shallow uh, marine seas. What uh, Klaus alluded to was that these uh, seas were founded by sediments. If you remove those sediments, then you expose further the salty crust which enables you to then close, uh, progressively close further back to the dock um, for all the continental crust back at the um, Permian, the Lake Permian. Um, this, from a geological perspective, this is it's quite feasible. Um, I didn't uh, need to invoke any um, pre-existing crusts or any subduction, by the way. Um, I just relied on the geological mapping to uh, dictate where these assemblages were and how they were configured. Uh, and then moving further back in time to the Permian, docking the continental crust. I'll just add to that, sorry. Um, by the time we get back to the Permian, we don't have any modern uh, oceans. We have a network of continental seas. So these seas are, of course, founded by Paleozoic, or Phanerozoic sediments. And back in time, moving back in time, that's the essence of my next podcast. Uh, okay, uh, perhaps I could just uh, interrupt there to say uh, we're going to run out in, in, of uh, this free Zoom time in uh, about three minutes. Uh, I've actually sent out everybody a, another email with another Zoom meeting request. Um, so, so I think if we leave this one and go to the other the other Zoom meeting, uh, we, we we should just be able to uh, continue the chat there uh, on that uh, on the next free Zoom meeting. So I'll, I'll 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 close this one down, and then hopefully everybody can rejoin. And uh, and I'll I, I'll also uh, resend out that um, that Zoom meeting for the next one in case in case you've lost that one. Okay, so ho hopefully, but well, yeah, oh, Bill wants to get something. All right, I still on mute. Oh no. Yeah, yeah I'm just, when would the meeting start? I'm not on a different computer than my email is, uh, like in a half hour or 15 minutes, something it, like it, that. It, it, immediately, I, I, was, I was thinking as soon as we end this one, we can, we can hopefully go on to the next and, and get another 43 minutes of Zoom time. Okay, I'm going to need to go to my computer and email to this computer your, your email so right. I get all the information. <laughs> okay, so I'll be, I'll be back. Well, you sent it out already? Uh, you, you, you should have had it previously. The uh, email I, th I sent. It, I think I sent it out about uh, about um, uh, a week or a fortnight ago, something like that. But I, I will as, as soon as I join into this next meeting, I'll go into my email uh, and find that email, and then, then and then resend it again. So, um, so, so, on so the seventh, Monday the seventh of this month. Monday the seventh, I sent it out, James. Oh, you've already sent you've already sent it out. Then that's the one that we linked to this meeting. Is that right? No, no. it's a different meeting number. Yeah, there should be another meeting. Okay, I'll try to see if I can find it. I'll be back. <laughs> okay, so sorry for this, but uh, I'm trying to do this all on on the free free version. Uh, this is the. Uh, this is the problem. So, so I'll, I'll end this meeting and then try and start the next one.